well thanks for talking to us um and we want to hear about your book basically so thanks. yeah so can you just um yeah sort of tell me where the idea came from when you decided you wanted to do it mm -hmm. and um and what it was like putting it together yeah i mean it was it's a very serendipitous journey that I never planned. All of this, me talking about myself and mental health and not only just me sharing these kind of quite intimate, vulnerable details of my own life, but also being put into this position where people want me to talk about something. It was never the plan. It's just that I started my career just wanting to be funny. I just want to be a clown on the internet. And as the time went on, for me, it was two things, which was one, I had that sense of responsibility creeping up on me where I realized that anyone with the platform, you have an impact on people. And even if you think you're just being funny, if you share yourself, people, they do relate to you and you do end up resonating with them on some level, no matter what you might want to think. And also just for me creatively, I have always been so career focused and one of those guys that really just pushes my well-being to the back to just be like career, career, career. Yeah. And after years of me doing that, it just got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore because it was not only just affecting my ability to be good at my job and, to, you know, be friends with people and a nice person to be around, but just creatively as well. It was this real hump where I felt like if I don't sort my life out and really get on top of these problems that I know are lurking behind me, then I'm just not gonna be able to go forward. And it was only that that led me to talk about my experiences with depression in that YouTube video, Daniel and Depression, that I uploaded in 2017. And, you know, that was a huge moment for me because I, even five years ago, there was such a taboo around mental health. I know these days a lot of people go, is that over? We're also open about mental health now. So like mental health, mental health, we will talk about it. But just five years ago, completely different world. And I thought me, not just like quite silly, it's like, like bringing up a word like depression, you think, oh my God, is this going to destroy my career? Are people not going to want to work with me? Are my friends going to think I'm strange? But just being vulnerable, especially on social media, we know what Twitter's like, is surely yeah. the worst idea you've ever had in your entire life. But I was, I was honestly, and this is the, the first instance in my life where I was surprised by the reaction I got from humanity because my upbringing, my experiences in life always led me to believe I was just very cynical and to always be very defensive and to protect my vulnerability. But actually, when I shared something that was so raw, people really they appreciated it like on some level people are like wow you articulating what you've been through made me understand something that I didn't understand about myself or oh my mum's been through this and now I finally get it or I can understand what my friends are going through but just some people saying you sharing this and being so honest made me connect to you more as a person and that for me it was this first moment of saying vulnerability is okay because sometimes when you open yourself up, despite the fear, despite you know how you feel like you might be judged, how it might affect your life, actually people appreciate it because this is how we all think and feel. You know, We're all vulnerable. We're all trying to protect ourselves, put up this front, focus on our careers, push everything to the background. But there is an inherent truth that when you open up and tell people how you really feel, not only is that a weight lifted for you, but it lets other people in. And then I became the mental health guy. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> it just, you know, it became my thing. And then you, the book, it's just, there's always been this idea of like, what, what would a book be? And everyone, you know, there's all these people want to write their life story or whatever. First, it, my entire life story, it's already on the internet. It was there in real time. I was there from the moment I was like, I'm dropping out of college. I'm a 19 year old with no plan. Watch me make terrible decisions in real time to having mental breakdowns, this, that, and the other, here we are. And also I'm like, I'm 12 years old. I don't have a life story to write about yet. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and then the idea of a mental health book, here's the thing. There are a lot of mental health books out there already, but people don't read them because they're boring. <laughs> and this is me. And for, it was this moment where I was like, why haven't I gone on this mental health journey to improve my own well-being sooner? It's because if you've had a really stressful week, the last thing you want to do is to do homework about your own stress and anxiety. It's just like, oh Jesus, spare me. So I thought, you know what, actually, if I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna partner with someone and it was HarperCollins and they were like, I think we could do something special. It's like, I wanna do a mental health book 
that is just, it gets straight to the point. It's not going to be too scientific. It's not going to be too spiritual or flowery. It's just going to give you the information you need, the tools, the tips, the life hacks, the stuff that science has shown to make a difference mm. as bare as we can bullet point form. And then my job is to make it stupid and funny by using myself as a punching bag example of, you know, basically everything terrible you could do to manage your own mental health. So that's how the book happened. It, it's not a plan, but for me, it was almost like, this is the book that I wish I had five, 10 years ago. And that's what I hope it can be for other people. Right. So no yeah. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So it was putting it together um, enjoyable once you kind of got that central idea I guess the permission to kind of make it fun I guess once you've given yourself that was it was it kind of you know was it yeah easy? it was the was it, it was the two prong assault of um ironic well it's not ironic it's just great that me writing a book collating all these you know life-changing tips for managing your own mental health was good for me <laughs> you know because the process of writing the book was kind of like reading it so I got first hand it was like oh my god I I needed the experience of putting this knowledge together so I could learn from it myself. So just on the informational side, yeah. it was, you know, it was hard, it was intense. It involved a lot of me looking at myself in the mirror, thinking about all the advice I was asking and then going, am I preaching any of this? No, absolutely not. <laughs> There's that clash where you go, okay, well, I now know all the X, Y, Z things I should be doing. And to what extent I am not doing any of them. <laughs> That's why I worry all the time. And then the personal funny side, it's kind of what I've learned from what I've done just trying to be funny is it's a bit of an excuse to give yourself therapy where you've set yourself this brief of, I'm gonna tell this story, I'm gonna make this point, I'm gonna make this joke about something. And in trying to find whatever story you're telling or joke you're making, there's actually a bit of a moment of self-reflection in there. So it's always fun to have an excuse just to tell a story and be funny. It's what I love doing. But for me, it's been, not just um, an interesting learning experience that I needed, but it's been very emotionally cathartic too, for sure. What were some of the main things that you kind of learned that were kind of new and that particularly sort of grabbed you or, or changed you even? Um, I mean, for me, one thing is just the 360 around your lifestyle, which is that, you know, there are things we can all do because the book is structured very practically into three parts. So the first part is what are things you can do right now to change how you think or feel if you're feeling overwhelmed. The second part is lifestyle. What changes can you make? And then the third part is going deeper, looking in kind of more long-term things about readjusting your mindset and working out what makes you as a person. And the process of going through the lifestyle for me felt a bit like a, a roast, <laughs> I would say, where you're going through these things and it's like the importance of your social life, the importance of your nutrition, the importance of how often you move. And for me, I was just like, this is very difficult to be aware of how really what might actually just be my personality and my preference. I'm an introvert. I'm a bit of a nerd. I like to stay inside. I don't like to party a lot. And I just learned that, you know, if you don't go jogging, you're going to have more anxiety than someone who doesn't. <laughs> and that's a bit of a slap in the face. So uh, it was, it was, good to have all that shown up but I think for me a nugget that was quite profound is the idea that you can always change how you feel because I used to have days where I was really stressed from whatever I was working on or a period where I'd be really depressed and sometimes I'd wake up and I would immediately know I'm not having a good mental health day I'm not going to be able to perform I'm not going to be a very helpful friend or anything like that and I just used to say to myself, this day is a write-off. It's just one of those days. But what I learned from this book is you can change how you feel by doing something whenever you want. There are so many things you can do because your activity directly influences how you feel. If you wake up and you're in a funk and you feel like this is a bad day, I can't do something about it. There are so many things you can do to change. And that was... It kind of got rid of the excuse because sometimes when you're like, oh, I'm just having a bad day. I simply cannot do that task. It's like, well, sorry, mate, <laughs> you, know, you, you probably can. But it's also empowering for yourself just to be like, actually, 
if I eat something, if I drink something, if I sleep, if I get a change of scenery, if I talk to someone, if I just problem solve, if I take a moment to question my thoughts and readjust my mindset, you can completely change how you think and feel on any day. And I think that with mental health, so many people go through their entire life thinking it's this weird, mysterious thing that they can't have an impact on. It's this, you know, mysterious fog that sometimes you just feel bad and there's nothing you can do about it. And actually, we're just, you know, complicated houseplants. We're just weird, hairless apes. We're not that complicated. <laughs> there are just little things that we can do. And then it's like, ah, oh, there you go. I snapped myself out of it. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, because it can sometimes seem like impossible problems, can't it? Overwhelming. How would you even yeah. start? But little little tweaks to your day can make all the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, great. And when? how did it fit into sort of last year and, and lockdown? down then <laughs> uh, I mean it's, it was almost a bit on the nose that I yeah. ended up doing this big you know journey into the world of mental health and back whilst locked in a little Harry Potter cupboard I'm an idiot and I am at this exciting point in my life where I'm about to own a house big I'm an adult go me I've been renting in London for 10 years the other day I just as a fun exercise worked out how much in rent I've just given to some random landlord over the last 10 years and I felt incredibly depressed don't do that mental health tip but um <laughs> I made a rookie error of believing some builders when they said that my house would be ready in six weeks and it took six months longer than I thought so me and my friend Phil moved into essentially a Harry Potter cupboard under the stairs type situation surrounded by all of our belongings and boxes and I have been trapped <laughs> in this cupboard and it has really the idea that this book is coming out at this time when not only am I about to move house, but our society is opening up again. It's like, it's almost a, a divine intervention that's saying there is literally no better time to sort your life out. And yeah. I think it's, it's great for everyone else because we've all gone through, you know, so much. It's like this collective trauma of what's happened with the pandemic and just the dent to our lifestyles and ability to self-care not only have we had all the joy ripped away from us but just those lifestyle things that I say are good for your mental health people haven't been able to go to the gym they haven't been able to get support from their friends some people have been forced to move back in with people that were probably not conducive to good mental health and this is a new chapter for everybody and even for me I'm seeing it as I can go to this next step and not just fall back into bad habits that I had before. This is a great time to just flick through this own little book that I did <laughs> for a few days, get a couple things in my head and go, this is a good time to put a pole in the ground and say, I'm gonna move forward, do it in a good direction that makes me healthier and happier. So yeah. What key things are there? Are you doing like new fitness stuff or like what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I need to, I should try, shouldn't I? <laughs> That's a lot of that. Um, a lot of it as well, I mean, not just the lifestyle stuff, but a lot of the best practices for managing your own thoughts, because I am a serial warrior. I'm one of these people that thinks myself into oblivion. I spend a lot of time up in my head. It's good for solving problems, because I guess I'm quite analytical. But what it means is I... I'm not very present. I don't really live in the wheel world. I spend a lot of time worrying about things in my head and kind of hypothetically prophesizing my own doom. And one of the things in this book is, you know, even just the very basic concept of mindfulness, realizing that you are not your thoughts. If you get a negative thought into your head, actually that's just your brain's suggestion that you should feel stressed about something and this, that and the other, but we don't have to stay fixated on these worries. So as much as for me, I am going forward thinking about how can I change my lifestyle? I've spent the last 10 years, you know, I've been going to therapy. I've been looking deep within myself, asking questions about authenticity, confronting my sexuality. But for me, it's even just day to day, having a better relationship with my own mind that when I get these emotions or thoughts that kind of want to spiral me into a panic or just make me feel very stressed, just to talk back to myself with the right attitude and say, okay, I don't need to go down this rabbit hole that just got sprung up by this thought in my mind. I can actually just acknowledge that it was an idea that my brain had for something to think about and I can choose to do whatever I want with it. I can solve the problem. I can break it down. 
I can ask for help. I can give myself a reality check or I can just acknowledge the thought and say, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do something else with my day because being present is a real struggle for me. And that's the thing that going forward, I, I know I need to be a lot better at. Yeah. Just going back to when you first sort of posted um, the video about depression then, mm. what, what were you like then? Can you notice the difference or are you aware of the difference between you then and you now? I mean, it's, it's just, it's absolutely profound. I would say that me age 26 was just someone that didn't question anything. And I think a lot of people relate to this, especially if you're in a period of your life when you're so career focused that you just think, I have a priority, which is that. And if I've got any emotional baggage or weird things that I need to work on or adjustments, it's just not important right now. And for me, as I said, I hit that wall where I felt like I couldn't go any further because I just, I'd run out of rope. It all burnt away and I had to address it. And, you know, for me, obviously there was the huge issue of my sexuality, which had an incredible impact on my mental health, my entire life story from childhood to how I was perceived as a public figure, how I operated day to day, and even my own acceptance of a thing that I knew was true deep inside me, that I had this incredibly toxic view of at the time. I needed to understand that. I went to therapy and I learned a lot of things just about the way that I would talk to myself and beat myself down and tell myself that things are the way I are and there's nothing I can change about this. I should tolerate certain situations and that was all wrong. So I've become a lot better at um, <laughs> being fair to myself, just really feeling comfortable accepting my own vulnerability instead of seeing it as I need to build up this huge wall to protect myself. It's that sometimes you can let the wall down, not just to be honest with yourself about what's going on in your life, which is important if you ever want to change anything for the better or if you want to grow, but it's also you get closer to the people when they feel like they can really see you. And unless you ask for help, you are always going to struggle. And the number one thing, you know, just to spoil the entire book, and I say this as an introvert who <laughs> doesn't enjoy it, but the number one thing for supporting your mental health is being able to get support from others, just feeling seen and heard, listened to, and that someone has acknowledged what you're going through is an immediate lifesaver that tethers you to reality because we all have these things that we don't share because we're afraid of them, these thoughts we don't want to acknowledge and the stresses we don't want to burden upon other people. But the moment you just feel like I've got it out there, I know it's real, someone else has seen me, even if they give you the worst advice ever or they're not a great listener, just putting it out there into the world means it's not this little thing gnawing at you from the inside. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Have you found that um, that your your job has sort of changed then in some ways you know as you because obviously you you know you, you you know part of being in your line of work you are exposing yourself you are being you are sharing a lot but have you yeah. found that you're sharing more than you did before or doing it sort of in a in a different way yeah it's definitely in a different way I mean I'm now just comfortable being one honest with who I am and what I'm going through but also not as edgy and defensive and just kind of bracing for the worst sometimes you have yeah. to have this attitude of you want people to accept you positively if you go through your entire life assuming the worst in everybody then you'll never get anything good <laughs> so at some point even if you're managing your expectations you have to open up a little bit to allow the positivity from other people to come in yeah. and you know, part of it is it all just used to be joke, 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 funny, 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 laugh at myself. Now there is an element of responsibility knowing that, you know, even as far as like, no, 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 there's no, there's no emotional vulnerability here. It's all laughs. And I've got you at a six foot pole. Someone would just be like, you may not want me to say that I've resonated with something that you've said. And I feel like I have a connection with you, but it's there. Therefore you have the power to have a positive impact. And that has, simultaneously made everything slightly harder because I know that there are, you know, there's a weight to everything that I do, but it's also made it a lot more important and therefore satisfying. So it's better. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, I mean, we're doing a lot of stuff at the moment about sort of young 
young lads, young boys in, in mm-hmm. particular, and there's sort of some of the pressures that they're facing. I mean, do you mm-hmm. sort of, um, you know, you like to say, you know, you have got a certain degree of responsibility within, you know, being a public sort of figure, but how do you, how do you approach that? I mean, do you, I mean, obviously you use humour and, mm-hmm. you know, that and, and also just by, I guess, role modelling a lot of this stuff. But like what was yeah. your, what's kind of in general your your approach to that, I guess? I mean, for me, the whole concept of masculinity was huge in my life because I had a very macho dad and, he, you know, he, he didn't know about anything. He didn't share about anything. It was all jokes. It was all tough on the outside. And it was that thing where... I got to like 16, 17, that age where you start to kind of notice adults for the first time and you cotton on to it and everything's not a, such a mystery anymore. And I could see that there were things that were stressing him out. There was pain that he was going through, but he didn't want to confront it. And I went to an all boys school and obviously there's that culture of like, there's no vulnerability, like absolute, no, 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 no. You can't let somebody, you can't give a small opening wide enough for someone to jab a protractor in and, you know, stab you with the sharp end of a compass or whatever the hell. And that was very much the culture that shaped me. And that is what continued through into my late twenties when I just had that moment that was like, you know what, actually being honest with yourself about something that's going wrong is bravery. It's not weak to admit vulnerability if it's gonna help you grow and become better and stronger and help you on your path in life. If you are honest with yourself about how you feel. And if you actually open up about it and ask for help, it requires strength to do that. So it's not a sign of weakness to go there. It's actually, you you know, that's procrastinating your whole life. It takes strength and bravery to go to the uncomfortable place and to be afraid of making yourself look bad. Because eventually you'll get to the other side, you'll grow, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh my God, why did I waste so much time trapped in a situation that wasn't good for me just because what I was uncomfortable with the idea of sharing like life is just a series of uncomfortable obstacles that you you put off until the day when you're going to do it but every single time you do it you look back and you go oh god why did I waste so much time not doing that sooner (laughs) are you still finding some of those you know some of your dad's sort of habits and teachings and behavior they still sort of sort of can you still see see him in you definitely and it's also just like what was the culture i looked at at the time because for me it was you know i saw simon amstel being mean to people on pop world ricky gervais on stage old frankie boyle on tv and i was like these are funny british men therefore this is what i need to base my personality on and i think that even all of those people it's not just me and getting older i think as a culture we've come a lot way just not having to have this insane bravado, which is obviously 50% complete bullshit because eventually, you know, Ricky Jermaine has to do a, a heartwarming sitcom about this thing. Frankie Boyle's going to write <laughs> Collins for the Guardian. Simon Amstel is going to go take some drugs in the rainforest and Peru or whatever. And I think it's that natural evolution of just a relationship with masculinity where you go, yeah, okay, we get it. But at some point, you have to just be honest with yourself. Otherwise, you're going to be that stereotype of the guy that puts way too much pressure on themselves. And then one day they snap because they just never let the walls down. And then eventually the dam's going to burst. Yeah, yeah. How's How have your sort of friends and people around you sort of reacted to all this? Have they kind of changed as well and and sort of worked around you a little bit (laughs) yeah Uh, I use my friends as guinea pigs sometimes and they don't like it either it's that thing where you're like okay I know that I'm stressed and I know that I worry about things and I know that I'm terrible but I'm telling them did you know this and they're like well I didn't but I feel bad about it now so thanks for sharing that with me (laughs) so there's a slight element of that but it's all in that mutual love mindset where you know that even if something is an uncomfortable growing pain sometimes or a bit bothersome it's like right well actually I know that if I do that I'll feel better the next day so yeah 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 yeah. so they have to basically yeah (laughs) (laughs) um do you think that the uh yeah that the world is changing somewhat though you know it's certainly a mental health conversation but do you think masculinity as well is, is is shifting Definitely. I think that, you know, roles in society, we're just, you know, it it makes you realise how Neanderthal the whole thing has been. And it's that idea that 
really the truth is as a man you should be able to do whatever you want and say whatever you want and if you have a personality where you're like you know what I've got a stiff upper lip and it works for me good for you but if someone else is like I feel pressured to hold this in and I feel like eventually I'm going to crack because I've got too much of a burden on me I can't open up I have to be big I have to be strong I have to do this that and the other it's okay to ask for help and to let go of that because it'll actually make you stronger and happier and I think that naturally that's what we're learning and how society is changing I think that conversations around mental health have just in the you know it's just every single year that passes these days it's just becoming so much more normal to ask a friend how do you feel no how do you really feel to go actually should I speak I've been feeling like this for a while now I know it's not normal to feel really bad for a long time I'm going to go speak to a doctor and there's still a long way to go just in terms of judgment misunderstanding not quite getting medicine lifestyle and you know I hope that the book for a lot of people will just spell it all out so they go oh, okay because you know for the important thing for me was that the book is all it's been fact checked by uh, a psychological professional called Dr. Heather Bolton, who is amazing. And all of the material in the book is from evidence-based practices that have been shown to have a nice effect. It's not just a nice sounding idea because we've all got that friend on Instagram that's like positivity. Yeah, yeah, here we go. And they'll share something and you'll be like, wow, that image had really great graphic design. It must be true. And it's like, <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so we're kind of, you know, we're entering this age of people are talking to each other, we're all opening up and this, that and the other, but there's also a lot of nonsense on Facebook and believing whatever someone down the pub tells you. So I think it's always important and especially, you know, pandemic, everything that's been going on here, microchip in, get your tinfoil hat on, we're all dying from 5G or whatever. It's like, no, we need to, we need to trust the scientists. And whenever we're thinking about ourselves and how we feel and our bodies and making changes to our lives, we need to trust the experts because it's not a mysterious fog. There are things that you can do. It's just that people haven't gone to find it. Yeah. Yeah. And how are you feeling about it? You know, being out in bookshops and everything, do you still sort of like, <laughs> does it still feel like very, a bit vulnerable for you to sort of like think about other people reading? Oh, absolutely. It? I mean, like ironically, um, it's been quite stressful for my mental health <laughs> writing a book about how to manage your anxiety. Um, not only because even though I've done it for so long, it, it feels like a part of me, you know, every single thing we talk about in the book, whether it's how to get a good night's sleep to, you know, the benefits of sex or going to therapy, looking at your, you know, family tree, thinking about your psychological makeup. I am using myself as an example for all of it so that people can see something to relate to and also just feel less weird. I didn't want anyone to think like, oh, well, I relate to that, but am I weird? So I'm there just bearing it all, punching myself in the head repeatedly for laughs. <laughs> um, and it's also just that I, I really care about it. Like I genuinely think that it's such an efficient book. It's not 400 pages of waffle and my life story and going off on a topic. It's just like, here's what you need to know. I'm just going to make the point, get over there and go. And I feel like it's, it's at such a good moment and I'm nervous because it means a lot to me and it's what I've been doing while I've been locked in a hole for six months but uh, it's also very exciting and I'm very proud of it so that's how I need to reframe it in my mind <laughs> if I'm taking my own advice. <laughs> Brilliant final couple of things um, is there like one section that you would show that you'd love to show yourself when you were sort of like say 17 18 is there like one particular bit Oh, definitely. It's just that whole idea of you have to be honest with yourself about who you are and what you feel if you want to solve the problems and feel better. And that sometimes, depending on your circumstances, there are things that you can't change, but you need, you at least need to acknowledge those things to know that someday you can change it. So, you know, if someone's 17 and they read my book, they might be like, I can't change who I live with or what I'm doing with my life or this, that, and the other. But at the very least, you have to be honest with yourself about what your issues are so that you can know the path to growing. Because, hey, life is short. <laughs> so none of us should waste any of it lying to ourselves. <laughs> and uh, what else are you up to this year now that we are emerging? What have you got planned? What else can you tell us about? 
Oh, I'm so excited to uh, own property and feel like an adult. That's big. It's going to be my 30th birthday, which is a huge one. That's scary. There should have been a whole chapter about how to deal with the inevitability of death and time, which I'm terrible with. I put so much significance on New Year. New Year, new me. I'm going to change my life. Birthdays. Oh, God, I'm dying. So, hey. (sighs) You know, the book coming out of Moving House, I feel like that just serendipitously lined up to get me through the idea that I am no longer 12. Um, <laughs> so fingers crossed for myself and hopefully reading my own book will prevent me from having an inevitable quarter life crisis mental breakdown. We'll see. <laughs>